All right. Good evening. My name is Kennedy. I'm in Dr. Lowe's uh, Rehabilitation Course 5320, which is in relation to understanding the medical and psycho psychosocial aspects of chronic illness and disability. And today I'm giving a presentation about assistive devices for those suffering from thoracic or thoracic injuries of the spine through to section T6 to T7. Um, more specifically, this is the area that affects the upper, anywhere from the center of the chest down, meaning that the person may have limited to no abilities to move their, their waist, their bowels, their legs, and any other sort. However, depending on the severity of the injury, um, they might actually be able to still use their, their chest, the heart, the shoulders, arms, and necks. So they have some sort of movement, but pretty much they're paraplegic from the waist down. <clears throat> so um, to kind of go a little more into that, um, again, it, having those type of injuries can affect the spinal cord or thoracic cord and cause very, very um, debilitating problems for them. For instance, um, most people who deal with spinal cord injuries, depending on which region it is, um, will not be able to do things. For instance, if somebody loses sensation of the lower body from the hips down, but they have everything else from the abdomen and up, then hey, that, they still have pretty good movement. However, for somebody suffering with thoracic injuries, um, it could mean the point that either one, they may require some sort of additional crutch or moving device to help them move for limited periods of time, or two, at worst, they may be permanently disabled, thus requiring a lot of additional assistance. So with that, in this presentation, um, we'll be going through some of the things that, that we won't be able to help for, as a rehabilitation counselor to provide assistance in, which will typically either be counseling or some other sort of management. And we'll also be specific on the tools and abilities that is gonna help that person manage through their new incurred disability such as a spinal cord injury. Um, you know, we'll be also talking about the difference between, um, <clears throat> what is it, para, para, paraparesis, or paraparesis, which is that partial uh, debilitating issue, and then the paraplegic, which is that complete loss. Um, in this first slide here, this is kind of like just a big overall talk about that. And again, we're just referring to that loss of body movement, sensations, and functions of the chest. Um, and also what comes with those problems for both types, you have people that are going to have little to no sensation, letting them know that they have to use the restroom or they're not going to have any sensation at all. And they can end up uh, having bad bowels and just releasing on themselves, unbeknownst. Um, that depending on the sexual orientation of the person, um, a male sex drive, from what I understood here, is that they can still erect, but for women may not have any sensation down their lower extremities at all. And um, also, again, depending on how severe the injury is, they may not be able to stand up properly. And especially with the paraplegic part, they're going to be using their upper body a lot more than others to manage to get themselves around. So we'll be talking about some of these additional assistive devices that are going to help them become mobile, help them to move, and also help them with their posture so like that they don't end up having a deformity in the back later or having um, bad bone or joint issues. Um, I know I mentioned something here about pulmonary function. So again, that just depends. And typically that's done with a medical assistive device. But again, this presentation, we're focusing strictly on uh, non-necessarily medical devices. <clears throat> I apologize for clearing my throat a lot. I'm, I'm always like this when I talk. Part of it's nervousness and part of it's just congestion. So um, again, there's two types of disabilities here. There's par paraparesis, which if the person had a severe injury, but not to the point that it completely um, debilitates their ability to, let me rephrase that. There could be an injury there, but if it's not to the point that they can use all function of the lower body, it may be a lifetime thing that they have to manage with. And therefore, with that management, um, of course, they're going to need assistive devices. However, with the severity is completely gone, meaning that the, the rest of their whole body have no control and function over, again, that's going to require a lot more additional help. So um, with that, you're going to hear one section about paraparesis, meaning again, that just that has some level of recovery for an individual, and depending on through therapy, they may have a successful recovery. But for most people, it's going to be, they're going to become paraplegic because it is a life-changing event. Now, what happens a lot of times with the spinal cord is that the whole spinal cord itself 
is the central nervous system that allows um, the human body to function. So for instance, um, with the spinal cord going through the back in the middle, the thoracic injury is somewhere here in the center. And so they may have complete mobility here, but everything now is, is a lack of thereof and not gonna be able to move as much. Now, if it's like a mild to a moderate injury, they may just require some things like maybe crutches or maybe a walker just to help them get through until they can regain some sort of sensation or some sort of um, abilities to continue moving and doing their stuff. And yes, there are some highly, highly amazing medical interventions for that, but typically normally through counseling, psychology, and um, of course counseling and using assistive devices such like this, it's gonna help them kind of manage their day-to-day -day lives. Today, their day -to -day lives. Um, with that too, I'm kind of skipping ahead here. Depending on how severe that spinal injury is, um, what happens a lot is again, people lose those bowel movements or they lose the ability to feel that they have to use the restroom, they may defecate on themselves. And um, what happens lots of times is that they have to carry something called a bladder bag on them and it looks unappealing, um, it really does. And, and I feel terrible when they have to carry those things. And I learned about a system device that kind of covers and masks that device so like that people don't normally see it. They think it's maybe some sort of utility pouch or something. And so um, they can wear it around the waist, you put the, the bladder back through the hole and it just looks like a typical belt. And you will never know that that's where they use the, to use the restroom at, you know, for their bladder movements. They use it in there and that helps them to release. So, you know, that can be used with somebody with paraphrasis and um, yeah. Now for more specifically, um, talking about those who are paraplegic and that's typically for most people with an injury in the thor thoracic region, um, they're going to require, again, a lot more help. So because they're, they're very extremely limited in movement, um, they could at some point maybe lose their ability to breathe correctly um, and so forth. So, but based on what I understand about the T6 and T7 injury here, and according to the textbook, um, basically it just means that they're going to have like the slight weakness and some loss of flexibility meaning that um, they're not gonna be able to move their bodies as much as what you would with somebody who doesn't have an injury or has a moderate injury in the spine and the back. So um, one of the things I really thought was very interesting to help somebody with a thoracic, thoracic injury, whether they're paraplegic or paraparesis, um, is this special device. And I'm just gonna go pop the video up here real quick so you can see this. Um, I thought it was amazing and that what this device does is that it helps them maintain their posture because one of the critical things of a person's physical recovery is that if you have bad posture, all that pressure and weight's going into the guts and the organs and all that over time over the years makes them have bad posture, it may develop health problems and some other things too. So having a good posture, whether they're in a wheelchair or walking is going to help them to manage their disability better. So um, this here I thought was a pretty interesting device. There's many of them out there, but I thought this braceability, the way it's set up, looks like it's comfortable and more easy or pretty much simple to use uh, when, when uh, operated it, so. So I don't know if you heard the video, but one of the things I like about this device is that it allows the person to adjust their posture based on the, the height and width of that individual. Now I'm sure this probably comes in various sizes. This person's a very hip, a fit, healthy person. But if you were to put it on the average, on the average individual incurring with a disability, um, I'm sure there may be the size adjustments for that. The good thing is, is that it helps to keep the spine posture straight as an excellent support. Um, so like that, even when they're sitting down or anything, they still maintain that good support and that's going to help them to breathe better too, on top of that. Um, also, what I liked about it is 
not so much this area, but this here, you know, depending on the weakness or the strength of their chest, you know, that may eventually hunch them down. So having that device right there, keeping them sitting up straight with the spine posture going, that's going to help them, of course, be able to do a lot more other things like move around, grab things, lift themselves up from the wheelchair or move or walk around. So this way, you know, they're not slouching forward and eventually deforming their, their posture. So that, I think that's one good thing. And plus it being adjustable, so it helps for, it seems like it helps for most people's sizes. Um, it looks comfortable based on the strap protection and everything, but it does look a little bulky. I mean, that is kind of one of the big things about it. But overall, I think that this is a pretty good device for anybody with a spinal base injury because it's going to help them to manage. Now, what could be a potential setback maybe to using this type of device is depending on how tight it is, let's say if the person's obese, like such as myself, um, this may not provide much breathability as far as them breathing to where their gut and stuff's out at. So there may be there may be some precautions to take if the person has breathing issues already. So, and that's probably what, like the only thing I've seen. But other than that, I thought this was a very interesting device that it, I think it's cost effective. It's not like, I think it's like two, $300. And I don't know if maybe the insurance can cover for that or get something similar, but that's one particular product that I definitely would advocate. Oops, that's the formatting. Okay. Now, again, going back to the bladder bags here, um, another thing with the bladder bags is that, is that they have to wear those things around the waist. Like for, for instance, you know, I just typed in, okay, that's a cyber back brace and bladder bag and for thoracic spines uh, let's see you know and there's a lot of different oh just type in bladder bags bladder bag and so what happens a lot is you know sometimes they may have to wear it around the legs to the restroom you have to carry these very very uh, bags for your mission uh, that's too medical. Bladder bag for uh, spine injury. There we go. I think that's what I put. And I can't seem to find it, but basically, I think called it. There we go. Bow bag. There we go. Bow bag. And if you look at these, I mean, like, who wants to wear something like this? This, this right here is, is very obvious, it kind of sticks out, and I don't think anybody's trying to fashion something like this. That's why when I found, you know, looking at this, you know, depending on the, the level of the devices here, as you can see, um, it depends, you know, and nobody wants to see it. They may want it in the skin texture or not. But I thought it was interesting to help improve a person's uh, sense of well-being or self-confidence. I think using some device like this here, that's going to cover that because people are going to think, oh, it's just a fanny pack that they hide their stuff underneath it. Or some people, it's a concealed carry. Who's going to know? It's covered and it's protected and um, allows them to peacefully use the, use the restroom, whatever they got to do, without the use of, without it being obviously seen over their clothes or over the shirt, you know? Um, so I think that's something that was like, I thought was very interesting. Um, and I think that can improve the person's confidence when they're out in public because now they're not carrying this big old black uh, bladder bag around and that's going to help them to um, uh, cover and conceal that better so they can feel better about themselves. <laughs> now another thing what happens for a lot of people with spinal cord injuries is you know can they walk again? Um, most people that are paraplegic if it's not as severe they, they might be able to walk for a couple of Maybe I think 150 feet is what they said on their own for a very, very short period. But that's going to take years of recovery or a lot of hard work. Most of the time what happens, though, is that they're provided um, a wheelchair. And more specifically, I think what will help a person, an individual, um, with some sort of spine injuries, and let me see if I can bring this to the front here, will be a, like a sports-type wheelchair because now that they're going to be using their chest, their arms, and everything else, this is going to help them to get around for mobility, especially if they're an athletic person that just lost their, their incurred disability. They don't want to feel like they have to use a lot of electronics or sort of say to help them get around somebody to push them around. They're going to want that independence. 
So using a, a wheelchair like this is going to help that athletic person who just got that back injury get that sense of feeling athletic again because they're using the arms, they're staying active, um, they're going between other in and out for other places, and it's keeping them there. You know, we, we see a lot of this in the veteran community when you have a lot of them who are paraplegic because of a spine injury from a blast from the IED or something, and you know they do a lot of sports in it. Um, I think it's pretty amazing because it helps them to get back on their feet and let them do stuff. Um, and I think as far as the rate, the price rates for these things isn't nearly as expensive as you would pay, like what I show here in a little while, um, is the electric wheelchairs where those things could go for almost $4,000, anywhere from six hundred to $4,000. And that's just because of the utility of it. But I think for most part, using an athletic uh, style wheelchair is going to help that person feel more confident and get them moving. Um, again, another thing here, which I saw that was pretty interesting is depending on how well the person is doing, this might be a bit of like a confidence boosting type of device. So they're going from their typical wheelchair that they use and they're stepping into like a specialized walker with wheels. And depending on how well they can move them and operate, it's going to allow them whether or not to continue going. And that can well too, you know, using a walker for them. And that just is going to help them give them balance if they're able to get up and do stuff. Now, for a paraplegic, this may be something like as an end goal for a rehabilitation counselor. Like, you know, if you're doing really good at this point and you're showing a lot of this improvement, you know, there could be a possibility to just try to get up to the point where you're just gentleman here at the end walking and using a device similar to this, which is going to help them. But of course, you know, there's going to be a lot of required therapy, a lot of required rehab, a lot of yeah, a lot of therapy and a lot of um, physical therapy to get to that point. But looking at something like this for somebody who's paraparesis para, para or halfway paraplegic, this could be something to, to kind of motivate them to get through. And I think this device is good too because it has the brakes, it has four wheels in there and a chair, of course, if they get tired. Um, but again, but there's danger though if they fall backwards. Now... One of the things that we talk about is like, how do we get a device to get them to walk and moving? What are devices to get them feeling like themselves again? Yes, those are important too. But another thing that's very important for somebody who's on a wheelchair and paraplegic is making sure that their living conditions have easy, easily accessibility to what they want to do. Now, in this picture here is a special, is a customized bathroom that shows that one, it's wheelchair accessible because if you look at the bottom, you know, there is no lip in between. And, and that's optional. Um, you don't have to. Some people have a low lip, so I gotta keep the water draining in there. But what's beneficial is that there's an arm rail to help them get up. Once they get to the spot here, they can sit from there to there. Um, this shower head is adjustable, so you can actually bring it down very low, and they can grab that with their hand. They can leave the wheelchair right here while they're showering. But it's also good for those athletic wheelchairs because you know they're sweat resistant, and so they're not gonna get wet. And then they have the the, the levers to choose as far as um, they want to use the top or the bottom, you know. I think this is temperature and this one's let the water run go. So, um, and having these things. Now, you know, what's going to be beneficial for them is make sure they have plenty of armrests for them to get up in case they fall. Um, that's a big plus. So like that, they can build themselves and bring them back up and sit down and have an ease of access to using their showers and all. This way, you know, they're not um, risking hurting themselves, trying to catch them that they used to be able to stand up for and hurt themselves. Um, and, you know, doing them about a remodeling, I mean, that's gonna cost thousands of dollars to do, but little simple things like just buying the arm rails itself are cheap. Um, I think some of the arm rails, I think are like $30, $40. You go to Lowe's here real quick. Bathroom, I think it's bathroom rails. Bathroom rails. Okay, so there's these type of devices too. Like the medical wet toilet is probably very cheap when it's $30. It just gets applied to the toilet seat. So once they're done using the restroom, they can use the arms and lift themselves up and go back into the chair. Most people with insurance like Medicare, Medicaid or something basic, this is gonna be more cost effective for them than doing a whole bathroom remodeling. Um, simply for the fact that, you know, that, that cost is thousands of dollars to do. But this here is very cheap and inexpensive. Um, there's also some additional things like uh, on the bathtub, if they can't get a bathroom model, is having this additional assistive device too, which it locks onto their toilet 
uh, toilet, excuse me, into the bathtub, and it helps them get up and down. Now, I've tried using it with my mom who has disabilities, and it's not the best. It can wobble out. But um, as far as cost effectiveness, it's going to be a lot cheaper than paying hundreds of thousands of dollars for, uh, tens of thousands of dollars for a remodel. Now, another thing that can be done too, and requires labor, probably just to hire somebody to do it, is arm rails like these. Um, they have them curve or straight. And I have this installed in my mom's bathroom because sometimes she loses balance. And I think for somebody who's also para paraplegic can benefit from using those as well, because it's gonna help them to get up and down to whatever they're doing. It's literally grounded and, and screwed and sunk into the walls. So like that, it doesn't move away and um, they can put things over it if they need to, like a washcloth or a towel. So those are definitely a big, big plus for them to have and use. And there's another one that's just like this, but it's curved. And that one, I don't see it here, but they have a curved version of that, of this thing. And that's also another big benefit. Um, but for the most part, I mean, those, those are pretty easy to get. And I think to do installations, you find the right person, maybe like 50, 60 bucks, and they'll just drill through the tile, put those things in there and install it. And there you go. You know, they have their armrest. And that's going to help them get along. Now, another thing too that may be kind of that will also be helpful for the person for ease of access, say if they live in a one story house um, here in El Paso, is they may need to require um, modifying their home for ADA accessibility. Keep in mind the person is in a wheelchair, so if the doors are very, if the width of the door is 32 inches, that's not going to be easy to get a, a wheelchair through that door. There's gonna be a lot of struggle and pushing and maybe breaking and cutting the edges. Um, I know for a fact that when my home was built, it was built for ADA accessibility. So instead of the width of the doors being 32 inches wide, they're actually um, 36 inches wide. Um, I think the most you can go to is 42 inches according to the American Disabilities Act. So um, uh, let's google.com and we're going to check out the uh, doors with uh, it, let's just 88, 88 door width, 88 door width. There we go. So, yeah, they say 32 inches going in there, but really you can go up to 48 inches with good to be two with around 36 to 48 inches is great because that allows either electronic wheelchair or a person with a wheelchair a regular wheelchair to get through in and out with ease of access. Um, that's also going to include things like ramps and um, swinging doors, perhaps. That's going to help them to easily get through inside in and out the house. Now, for those privacies, um, I noticed that the ADA doesn't recommend typical doorknobs that are around it. They suggest doors with a lever, which makes sense. You know, it's easier to open. And um, perhaps, if it's possible, you can have the doors. Um, Instead of swinging inside, they can swing, or excuse me, instead of swinging from when you open it back to towards you or out towards your way, you can have a swing in the opposite way as you're going in and out, you know, or you have it multi swinging left of uh, going in and out of the room. So that way they're not getting stuck here and there if they have to pull, pull the door back to get into their room. Another thing too that can be helpful because there's a lifestyle change when you're in a wheelchair is um, also looking at modifying things like your. Never bring this to the front here. Is modifying your kitchen or countertops that allow you as the person who's wheelchair accessible to manage and do your dishes. Like, I, I'm sure this is a lot of money to do. You know, not everybody can afford that. I don't think the insurance company is gonna cover all these things. But if the person is able to afford it, you know, this is an option that they can do where they can cut the, the, the height of the sink, the stove and all that to a halfway so like that you can do some cooking, do some dishing and washing and give them that sense of independence. Um, also, in addition to that, this isn't the best picture here, but as you can see, um, the stove or the oven is kind of low bent too, so they can help grab and get things, pull the stuff and get out, you know, because they have their upper body movement. However, most of the time they're going to require a caregiver or someone that's going to cook for them because especially here in El Paso, unless they're coming from a mid-wealthy family, they can't afford a lot of these things. But the simple stuff like, you know, switching out the doorknobs, doing the door swingings, getting the, getting ramps, ramps are pretty cheap. As, as a matter of fact, um, 
let's look this one in here. We'll go go to a quick store shop. Um, um, Walmart.com. There we go. A door ramp or floor ramp, excuse me, floor ramp is excellent because you just put that where the lip of your any step drag coming in and out the house or around and they're going to be able to get up and down just fine getting nothing fancy and this is steel but you don't really need steel they have rubber they have wood they can be constructed and so that's another thing they can use now um this is something good for like outside that they want longevity and but they're going to pay a lot of money for it but typically for the most part um, you don't need to pay for anything that expensive. Like, for example, this four scale ramp here is 200 and something. That's a lot cheaper. So, um, again, you know, those little things like that is going to be more cost effective than trying to do a home remodel. But the, the, the key to it here is that when a person is paraplegic, their lifestyle is going to change. And there's some things that they used to do that they're not going to be able to do, which goes into my next section of, of recommended assistive devices as well. Now, Depending on the person's insurance and depending on the severity of their disabilities, typically their insurance company will cover things like an electric wheelchair. Um, and the reason why I'm not suggesting any particular brand of electric wheelchair, because it's really based off the person's insurance. If they have Medicare, Medicaid, they might have one generic brand that's assigned to them and they don't get a choice. If they have a private insurance that they pay a higher premium for, but that's going to give them higher coverage. They can buy something like this device, this electric device here that allows the battery to run for eight hours, gives them the ability to move around wherever they want in a store, outside the store, in a house. And um, I think it costs about $3,500, $3,600. So give or take with taxes and everything, close to $4,000. And, you know, that's a, and it's a, I'm sure it has a lifetime warranty and everything for it. And what's good about this is that it has wheels, it has pretty much six wheels on there, two main big wheels, two small ones to adjust for like if you're going up and down bumpy areas and it has armrests that have, let you move around and gives you comfort and it has a belt. So that way you don't end up falling out of your wheelchair if you're to the point that you don't have that good balance. You know, this is really good for people who are maybe obese and have a spinal injury because they're not gonna fall out as much. Um, they might have wide tights for that too. But again, you know, depending on the insurance, depends on whether or not they can get that as compared to let's say these the other wheelchair that's on this that's going to get them around what they need to do the same thing but again another thing with this too with manual wheelchairs let's say like for an everyday person um if they don't have good control with their arms and stuff to it they can easily fall back on a ramp slide backwards or hurt themselves as compared to something that's a little more expensive this is going to stop them from sliding because it's going to stop them right in their spot. Now, what happens for those who are paraplegic, if they can't afford it, um, some of them may, if they, they have a good job, a good company, let's say you're working for a private corporation as a rehab counselor, um, maybe they might be able to afford getting a modified vehicle that's going to help them get around um, their town and the neighborhood. So they can use a wheelchair up here. They, they're driving uh devices are set for them as a paraplegic to drive in the wheelchair and stuff back here with seat ramping now i don't recommend any particular vehicle because there's different types of vehicles for it as a matter of fact when i was looking this up i had vehicle assistant there we go i was looking at the uh national highway traffic safety administration because they're the, the rule makers for this and you know they're saying that's a possible cause. That's a lot of money. But if they can afford it, sure. You know, it's just like doing an auto loan. They'll have the auto loan for it. Choose whatever company that's given them these, uh, you know, help them with these devices for whatever brand. And, um, and then they'll be able to do that. And when I was looking at this, I picked, yeah, I picked about mobility de dealers and the thing with that is if the dealership is in connection with the National Highway Traffic Administration, um, you know, then they can get themselves built a special vehicle like that for them. But again, it's based on whether or not they're able to, because if not, they, you might not even see a paraplegic person driving with a thoracic injury. But what they will need, though, is whoever's taking care of them, the ability to get either their electric wheelchair or manual wheelchair to and from their, their location and place because it's going to be with them for life. 
And so um, having things on vehicles like this here, like it's an automatic uh, lift machine to where, to where once they're inside the vehicle, they sit down, the caregiver, whoever brings their wheelchair stuff, locks it in here, and then it lifts us up into the vehicle and puts it right behind. So it's kind of like a little tailgate, so to speak. You know, it's like they're, they're towing their thing along, just waiting on there. Another thing I see a lot, especially here in Texas, is a lot of these uh, cranes. And believe it or not, you would think that this might be slightly more expensive than this. Actually, this is actually pretty cheap to install a crane for your vehicle, especially like I'm, me being a truck driver or owning a truck. Um, that was run very, oh, I guess it's not here. I thought that was pretty ingenious that, hey, I only 100, I think it's $176. So yeah, it's about 157 with tax and everything. You might look about 170. Um, they put it in the back of the, the truck. It locks it in the spot. Once they're done with the wheelchair or they use the devices, then they get up and move around. They can crane their either electronic wheelchair or regular wheelchair into the thing. It transports it and brings it into the truck, and then it puts it in. And then, he just, and then it's locked from there. It doesn't do anything. That way it helps them get the wheelchair on and off the vehicle. Usually that happens a lot with somebody who is neat who has a caregiver, they can do that for them. Because again, unless they have a, maybe a van that they can put the ramp up to put the wheelchair in, or if they have their own vehicle, this might be the next best thing too. And they might still have a sense of maybe some independence because who wants to go trade out their truck to go have to get a modified vehicle and still pay more on a loan. And that's expensive. So um, I know I'm looking at these devices from a lot of the limitations based off the insurance and cost availability. But these are um, various types of assistance programs and devices that can be used to help a person with thoracic injuries, uh, specifically in the spine, because one, if they aren't severe to the point that they can no longer breathe and they have mobility from the chest up, they can, they can learn to be, take care of themselves. And through the use of some of these assistance devices, um, it'll help them feel more sense of independence and be able to be more mobile and active. Um, and with speaking of that, I'm going to see if I can find a good video for you of people with spinal injuries, in particular the military, and having wheelchairs for sports. So let's see, veterans, uh, uh, veteran spinal injury sports, spinal injury sports, and oh, that's not it. Um, Special Olympics. And the paraplegic prisoners who have injuries. You know, the dependent if they're athletic, these are paraplegics. See, para, and these are paraplegic people with spinal injuries. They don't have any mobility over their legs. Um, I'm sure some of them, they may just have just their chest and arms, but they train themselves to keep moving. And look at it, they're racing together. Okay, they're still being able to do this stuff. So one of the big things with spinal base injuries, yes, depending on severity, it could be fully limitation or maybe halfway, depending, you know, depending on the person. But they can um, continue to function. They can continue to live and be able to do these things so long as they take care of themselves. They seek out the resources that they need. Um, if they talk with a rehabilitation counselor, we can find some of these devices that may be covered underneath a voc rehab program that we're employed under. So, you know, it really just depends. But overall, the big key takeaway from this and the assistance devices is um, based off whatever insurance is, based off whatever they're able to afford, you can work with a paraplegic person to help modify their lifestyle so like that they can feel independent and everything else. Um, thank you for your time in this presentation. I most certainly appreciate this, appreciate the time, and I'm sorry if I have to talk very lengthy about this, but um, it, I think it was really interesting learning about this and sharing it with you also like that you can get an idea of, it's not just finding a device that's gonna help them move mobile. You also gotta think about their living environment, their social interaction, and their overall, the, the, the overall person, the center of the person's being, so like that you can get them up and running. Um, have a good night and stay safe.